To commemorate its first 40 years of service, United First Federal Savings and Association presents this film to the citizens of our community. United First Federal has served a vital financial role since 1934. We are proud of our city, and we are proud of our contribution to its growth and prosperity. We look forward to 40 more years of dedicated service. Congress opened South Florida for homesteads. In December 1842, William H. Whitaker arrived at Yellow Bluffs on Sarasota Bay to become Sarasota's first settler. Bill and Mary Jane Whitaker would have 11 children, and over a hundred years later, their direct descendants would still live in Sarasota. Gradually, the small settlement grew to over 100 families. And by 1885, a group of Scottish settlers arrived. They'd been promised a town, but none existed. And after a bitter winter, many of them returned to Scotland. Those that remained joined the American settlers to plant the town of Sarasota in July of 1886. The British landowners sent John Hamilton Gillespie to handle the company's affairs. Under his direction, the village of 1887 slowly emerged from the wilderness. Streets were cleared and grubbed with a dirt crown, and buildings began to line Main Street. In 1895, a channel was cut in Upper Sarasota Bay, and steamers began to make regular calls. When the mistletoe began round trips three days a week, the community had a dependable connection to the outside world. Fish, vegetables, and fruits were taken more easily to Tampa markets. The rapidly growing fishing industry became the mainstay of the village. I do know there was an awful lot of fish. I, I can remember being in a boat and the, uh, those luscious uh, pompano would jump into it. Fishing was, it was just tremendous, and it wasn't only fishing, it was the, the scallops, the, the oysters. We had our own oyster bed, and you could just go out there and just pick as many bushels of fresh oysters as you wanted to, and just a while, scallops were all over the place. Fish all you wanted. The DeSoto Hotel, built by the company under Gillespie's supervision, had 30 rooms, large lobby and dining room, and was considered the finest hotel on the West Coast. Water for the new hotel was from an artesian well drilled on the triangle at Five Points. And many Sarasotans got their drinking water from the Five Points Fountain. At Maine and Palm, another well provided water for free-roaming cattle and hogs. In the late 1800s, the village of Sarasota resembled a western town. Cattlemen prospered by supplying beef for troops stationed in Tampa, the main debarking point to Havana in the Spanish-American War. Just before the turn of the century, Sarasota got its first newspaper. Cornelius Wilson, and later his wife, published the Sarasota Times for 23 years without interruption. While the young town existed as a fishing village, Sarasota was virtually isolated. Goods were shipped by boat. There were no industries and no land transportation. But things slowly improved. On October 14, 1902, Sarasota voted to incorporate as a town. And John Hamilton Gillespie was honored as the first mayor. The population had soared to 350, and the town boasted of its first jail, its first refrigeration plant, and sidewalks. Being a Scotsman, Gillespie loved golf. 
and he built what was said to be the first golf course in the United States. So Dad watched this Colonel Gillespie knocking a ball around the edge of this pond. And finally, Colonel Gillespie happened to see him and said, Lad, have you ever played golf? And my father said, No, sir. And according to Dad, son, you're missing half your life. Gillespie eventually built a nine-hole course complete with clubhouse on a 100-acre tract. 1903 brought more signs of progress. The first street lights, the first phone exchange with 48 subscribers. Fred Knight's drugstore sold everything from patent medicines to garden seeds. But the event that had startling impact was the coming of a railroad. The Seaboard Airline Railroad reached Manatee in December 1902. And in the early days of 1903, the tracks were extended to Sarasota. The first train puffed into town March 22nd, 1903. That time the railroad ran, ex uh, ran an extension right on out onto a pier out into the bay. There were three fish houses there and the various fishermen would bring their catch in. It would be processed and iced and that night shipped out uh, by express. At that time, you uh, came to Florida and you bought a trunk and you went to Bellhaven Inn or one of the hotels and you stayed most of the winter. That was uh, the custom. In 1904, the first sewer was built, serving one whole block. In the same year, Sarasota got its first bank and this five-room schoolhouse. Churches began to organize. By 1906, the Episcopalians and Methodists had established congregations. Dr. Jack Halton arrived from Muncie, Indiana, and by 1908 opened the first medical facility, the Halton Sanatorium. The Bayview Hotel on the northwest corner of Maine and Palm, only two years old, caught fire. And in minutes, the 16-room wooden structure crumbled, shooting sparks across the rooftops of other buildings. Without a volunteer fire department, not even a community hose, the townspeople watched and prayed. This fire and many more which followed prompted the citizens to form a volunteer firefighting force. By 1915, the firefighting equipment included a $9,000 LaFrance pumper and hose truck and a racy, low-slung speedster for the new fire chief. Well into the 1900s, roads were poor or non-existent. Sarasota still depended on the railroad and boats for transportation and commerce. I can remember when the road went from here up to about Whitfield Estates. And that was the end of it. I went on Tampa one time in with my Aunt Jessie. We went up from here to Bradenton and up to Palmetto, and then you took off through the woods. And it was just a sand trail. Well, you know, when we first came down here in 1925, the only road that was in existence was a nine-foot asphalt paved road. You didn't try to pass them on that road, but every time you met anybody, you had to put your right-hand side of your car out on the on the shoulder to pass them. It was only a nine-foot road. Oh, yes, I remember those uh, brick streets. And you know, it, it was a practical thing. Because if the street got rough, uneven, all they do is take the bricks out, roll it, and put them back down. And I can see those people laying, uh, those fellows laying those bricks now. They can really go to town on them, put them down there. Gulfstream Avenue in 1912 still wasn't paved, but the town now boasted of electricity from dusk till midnight and breakfast current from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. The waterfront, long an eyesore with rotting seaweed and debris, caused the town council to decree that seawalls must be built at the expense of the property owners. The result was a beautiful waterfront, ever since a Sarasota trademark. When Gillespie's first hotel, the DeSoto, was sold, the new owners renovated and expanded the building and renamed it the Bellhaven Inn. It was called the finest winter resort in the area. And advertisements spoke of large, airy rooms, with or without fire, 
and private sulfur baths. On November 6, 1913, many citizens turned out for a public work day declared by Mayor Harry Heigl. The men graded a new park at the foot of Main Street and the women planted grass and flowers and served refreshments at the Bellhaven Inn. Next to the park, the Hover Arcade and Pier was built. Its original design provided for a moving picture house and Dave Broadway's restaurant and ice cream parlor. And later, for many years, it would serve as City Hall. The influential women's club built its clubhouse in 1915. Sarasota's women worked hard beautifying the city, planting coconut palms along the waterfront, and pushing the program for sidewalks and hard surface roads. The first Sarah DeSota pageant was held in 1916 and lasted five days. The highlight was the parade, complete with decorated cars, bands, and excited youngsters. See, I wasn't but uh, maybe seven years old, at the most going on eight. I know they had a, uh, they reenacted the legend of uh, Sarah de Soda. They fell in love and she died and, and they, they uh, took her body out in the middle of the bay and uh, buried her and the Indian that was in love with her dove off and followed her. That was the legend. By the early 1900s, personalities began to emerge who would shape the young town. Harry Heigl, one of the progressives, gave Siesta Key its name, changing it from Sarasota Key in 1907. His land company began selling lots, and in those days, the only way to get to them was by boat. Arthur Britton Edwards was born on the shores of Sarasota Bay in 1874. A.B. probably contributed more than any one man to Sarasota's ultimate destiny. When Sarasota was incorporated as a city in 1914, he became the first mayor. During the boom years, A.B. built one of the finest theaters on the Florida West Coast, the Edwards Theater, later known as the Florida Theater. Through A.B. Edwards' continuous efforts, Mayaka State Park was created to preserve the primitive beauty of this Florida region. His most important contribution, however, was arousing the interest of Mrs. Potter Palmer in Sarasota. As a result, Mrs. Palmer, a wealthy Chicago socialite, made heavy investments in land, citrus, and cattle. Mrs. Palmer eventually bought more than 80,000 acres, and her decision to choose Sarasota for her winter home was a page one story in almost every newspaper in the country. In these developing years, Sarasota was part of Manatee County, and the need for better roads, schools, and utility improvements for Sarasota were largely ignored by Manatee County commissioners. The town grew, but progress was painfully slow. Rapidly, a separation movement gained strength. A bill was ratified by an overwhelming vote, and the new county of Sarasota became a reality July 1st, 1921. Almost immediately, the young county of Sarasota was caught up in the Florida land boom. Visitors by the thousands swarmed into Florida's resort cities, and the winter of 1922 was a record-breaking tourist year. Crowds lined the Sarasota beaches. Lightweight Model Ts with skinny tires drove right to the water's edge. And the bathing suits were shockingly brief. With the influx of tourists, real estate went crazy. Salesmen lined up to meet each incoming train, and the stories of fortunes made overnight were unbelievable. Glowing advertisements in northern newspapers brought more and more investors to fuel the land boom fire. With the land boom came a new wave of building activity. Ground was broken in October 1922 for the Miramar Hotel. The hotel and apartment complex included Sarasota's first auditorium, seating 1,200. 
A fashion show at the Miramar in 1924 displayed the latest styles, even a natty outfit for the lady golfer. Dialing 2300 would bring Sarasota's first yellow cab to your door. During this period, Sarasota's skyline started upward. The first bank and trust company building in 1924 was one of the first skyscrapers. Another, the Terrace Hotel on the site of the old Gillespie Golf Course, was still out of town in the 1920s. Into this picture of feverish boom activity came the dynamic personality of John Ringling, who was to influence the city as no other individual before or since. Through Ralph Caples, general manager of the New York Central Railroad, the Ringlings became interested in the area. Here was the beginning of the most important series of events in Sarasota's history. The first of Ringling's many colossal building projects was his mansion, Cottage On, or the House of John, modeled after the Doge's Palace in Venice, Italy. He uh, lived in a very sumptuous style that even for the 20s and 30s was certainly unusual for a town the size of Sarasota was at that time. He always had liveried servants. He entertained there in a very sumptuous way. And on his yacht, the Sea Lion, Ringling hosted many of the famous personalities of the day while cruising Sarasota Bay. Ringling acquired vast land holdings. His purchases included mainland waterfront tracts and many of the undeveloped offshore islands, Bird Key, St. Armand's, Coon and Otter Keys, Lido Key and the southern end of Longboat Key. By 1923, he began dredging to build up the mangrove islands and to fill around Golden Gate Point. To provide access to his planned island developments, Ringling began construction of a bridge and causeway to connect Lido and St. Armand's with the mainland. It would cost three quarters of a million dollars. When it was completed in 1925, Ringling deeded it to the city. The causeway became a popular fishing spot, and at times it seemed more populated with fishermen than cars. In 1926, Ringling began construction on the Ritz-Carlton Hotel at the southern end of Longboat Key. Planned to be the showplace of the South, Ringling spent over $650,000 on construction before the collapse of the Florida boom brought the work to a halt. The structure, half finished, stood like a ghost hotel until 1964 when it was finally torn down. The land boom continued into 1925. During October alone, land sales in Sarasota totaled over $11 million. These magic years transformed Sarasota into a modern city with new schools such as Sarasota High School, built in 1927 at a cost of $317,000. A new hospital, a modern business district, parks, playgrounds, and a municipally owned golf course. Then, the bubble burst. The land sales miracle in Florida stopped abruptly. The crash was severe, but Sarasota still had John Ringling. And many of his building projects continued, providing employment for hundreds. Ringling began construction on his most lasting contribution the now famous museum which Ringling willed to the state of Florida. The John and Mabel Ringling Art Museum, begun in 1927, was completed in 1930 at a cost of two and a half million dollars. It houses the finest collection of Rubens paintings in America, worth well over 16 million. The Ringling Brothers Circus Winter Quarters presented another economic boom to the city when it arrived in 1927 and put Sarasota into national news. The circus alone coming here was an awful shot in the arm. In those days they had 1,500 employees, you know, so they would congregate here before they go out 
And then, of course, the fact that there was a circus headquarters brought in thousands of people here from St. Petersburg, Tampa, and every place else to see the circus. And they finally developed it in the spring training when they'd go into uh, rehearsal, you know, and bring in all these famous acts. And this was a big shot you know, financially uh, for a small community. Today it wouldn't represent so much, but it certainly did then. The frantic pace of the 1920s gave way to the depressed 30s when local construction was at a standstill. Federal projects were sought to bolster the economy. The post office was built in 1934 at a cost of $110,000. In 1937, a WPA project built a municipal auditorium, cost $131,000. The WPA was also responsible for another valuable asset, the first Lido Casino. With its unique seahorse design, it was a popular beach landmark for years. Winter visitors still came, many of them tin can tourists. By 1936, a trailer convention brought over 1,000 units and 2,600 people. They were housed on a 60-acre tract of land given to the city by Calvin Payne. Payne Park was also home for Major League Spring Training Games. The Giants in the 20s, the Red Sox in the 30s, and the White Sox in the 70s. Sarasota's small airport on Fruitville Road was replaced in 1938. The Sarasota Manatee Airport Authority was formed and WPA funds built a modern airfield. During World War II, the Army Air Corps used the facility to train fighter pilots. When the war ended, the Sarasota Bradenton Airport came into being, and by the 1970s, it was served by both Eastern and National Airlines. And with the end of the war, Sarasota began another boom period that continued uninterrupted into the 70s. Population doubled every 10 years. The skyline of the city changed dramatically. Bridges and new roads. New schools. Modern homes. And some apartment buildings. greatly expanded medical facilities. The faces of the city and county changed almost daily. The artistic heritage given the city by John Ringling flourished as never before. Sarasota became the home of countless artists, many of national renown. Open-air art shows showcased their works. This one at First Federal Plaza. The Oslo Theater was added to the Ringling Complex. Little theater groups thrived and expanded. The Van Wezel Performing Arts Hall lured top artists from around the world and provided an acoustically perfect setting for the Sarasota Concert Band and the Florida West Coast Symphony. The sun and the sand. The ingredients that started it all many years ago continued to lure people to Sarasota's shores. Uh, growth doesn't distress me as it does so many people. Everybody seems to like the community the way it was when they came here. Uh, Mr. A may be here 10 years, Mr. B 20 years, and Mr. C 30 years. Uh, and that's the way they liked it. Well, we can't, we can't split ourselves up and, and accommodate all of these people that to me are fairly latecomers. So I like it the way it is now. And if it changes in the next 10 years and I'm still here, I'm sure I'll like it then. The growth of Sarasota from a small, sleepy fishing village to a modern, prosperous city has been the creation of many men and women. Their devoted efforts over the years have projected the ideals of the past into the present to ensure that Sarasota shall continue to be a place 
of beauty and contentment.